Hi guys and welcome back to the Mighty Blues. Welcome back to another episode of the podcast. It is episode 6. We are here to sit down and talk about the latest Everton news as well as our upcoming game against Chelsea on Monday evening. We're going to talk about Everton's recent two-point deduction in today's episode. We're also going to talk briefly about last weekend's win against Burnley because it was a huge, huge win even though we've had two of those points taken away from us. So really it feels like a draw. It was still a a massive, massive win. uh, I think in the grand scheme of, of, of things at the moment for the football club for the players' confidence, for for the for the fans really to take a little bit of pressure, a little bit of stress away from the fans, a little bit of a weight off of our shoulder. Um, and even though we obviously were hit with a point deduction a couple of days later, I think this is a win that could give us a little bit of a confidence boost going forward with some really, really important games coming up. As we've just said, we have got a game on Monday night against Chelsea at Stanford Bridge. We're going to go into greater depth on that one later on in the podcast. An incredibly difficult fixture a side that we've not beaten away from home since the 90s I believe certainly in the league I think we might have won there once in the cup but in the league it's been a long long time since we went to Stamford Bridge and walked away with three points so a hugely difficult task for Sean Dyche and these Everton players but after getting our first win in four months ending that winless run and giving us at least something to be excited about for the you know, for the weekend, you know, it was good until, what was it, Tuesday afternoon when the point deduction news was released. It was all right up until then, wasn't it? Um, But hopefully that win, you know, as I said, can can give us a little bit of confidence and a little bit of momentum going forward, even with the points deduction. um, I suppose it's the, the manager's job now to focus the players' minds on performances on the pitch and, and taking, you know, momentum and confidence from winning games as well. And, and the, the manager's got <clears throat> a difficult difficult task now because I've got no doubt in my mind that on Saturday afternoon those players were probably feeling on top of the world they were probably feeling relieved they were probably feeling you know motivated confident they've gone out there okay it wasn't a great game of football but they managed to walk away with a big three points and then it comes to Tuesday and they get that news and you know another point deduction I think there was an interview with uh, Dwight McNeil and it might have been Jared Branthwaite correct me on that but Dwight McNeil was definitely in the interview uh, because I don't even think he looks up at the camera once, his head's just down, sort of looking down, and, you know, I've said this before, and I'll say it again, I think we often, as football fans, uh, get a little bit carried away with footballers, because of the fact that they earn lots and lots of money, because of the fact that they're protected hugely, you know, it's not like it was in the 70s and 80s, where you could walk into the city centre, and you'd see, a, you know, three or four players that played for your football club, sitting around the table in the boozer, having a few pints, and you know, a, of a weekend, or you know, in, in, in an international break, if they've not gone away with their countries, it's, it's, it's not like that anymore, footballers are so, so protected, you know probably one of the most protected groups of people in the world um and they are seen as sort of untouchable celebrity superstars aren't they the money that they earn you know the the lavish life that they live and and as i said the fact that they are so far removed from us fans and, and, and normal people um it's often quite easy to forget that they are actually human beings as well and that they are normal you know everyday lads that a lot of them are similar ages to me and, and will think and will act and will you know will have the same sort of feelings as me as well just because they're earning a lot more money and they live a lot you know a lot more of a lavish lifestyle um doesn't mean that as personalities and as people they're any different and I just want to give a a shout out to Still Ryan just before we go any further into this podcast because Still Ryan uh, I'm sure a lot of you know Still Ryan if you if you know me you definitely know Still Ryan unbelievable content creator absolutely unbelievable human being you'll have seen him outside the ground doing interviews and, and little videos with various different fans and young lads and girls and obviously adults as well Um, absolutely unbelievable unbelievable fella I've, I've been lucky enough to spend a little bit of time with Ryan over the last year or so we get along absolutely brilliantly he's a lovely lad dead sound lad and we clicked instantly we you know as soon as we sort of met each other we hit it off instantly and 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 um yeah, really, really top guy. Uh, but Ryan did a live stream earlier on in the week where he was playing pro clubs, FIFA pro clubs or EA 
FC Pro Clubs, whatever it's called now, uh, with a couple of the Everton players. He had Dwight McNeil on, he had Nathan Patterson on, and he had James Garner on as well. I think he might have had um, James Tarkowski on at one point as well, but I didn't see that 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 part. I just seen uh, James Garner, Nathan Patterson, and Dwight McNeil. And um, I remember clicking on it to watch it and thinking, okay, this will be interesting because I know what Ryan's like. Ryan's a very high energetic, you know, very positive um person and and, and, and I knew that he would he it wouldn't be a case of him just sort of sitting there not saying much because he's playing pro clubs with a lot of the Everton players. Uh Ryan, you know, himself is is is, is often mixing with the players at Finch Farm or at Goodison or, or wherever. So I dare say he's probably got a, a close personal relationship with a couple of them. Now certainly James Garner he, he seems to have a close personal relationship with him which is absolutely great. But I watched the stream, um, and not only was it absolutely fantastic and unbelievably funny throughout, I mean, Nathan Patterson is hilarious. I could sit and watch Nathan Patterson talk for hours and hours and hours and hours on end without getting bored, but it also hit me a little bit because it was a fantastic opportunity for us as fans to see the normal side of these players and to see the fact that these players are just everyday regular lads. Now, yeah, okay, I understand they're not because they get paid, you know, amounts of money that the majority of us will never see in our lifetime and they're very, very lucky to have that lifestyle that they live and, and, and um, you know, be able to afford everything that they can afford. I understand all of that, but just in, in, in the sense of their personalities, they are what you would expect 23, 24, 22 year old lads to be like. They enjoy playing FIFA, they have a little bit of a joke with their mates, they don't take their themselves too seriously and and I think it was really, really nice for us as Evertonians to see that side of the players on Ryan's stream. And I think it was really, really nice to see Ryan um, sort of interacting with them as well. And, and it, it did come across like they were all just one big group of mates. And it felt like I was watching uh, just a, you know, a group of mates playing pro clubs exactly like I'd play pro clubs with my group of mates. Or, you know, I know there's a, a number of uh, really popular streamers that have got pro clubs things going on at the moment. And it's quite entertaining to watch the chemistry and watch them going back and forth and bantering and having and a laugh and stuff and and it was a really 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 fantastic to see the Everton boys uh doing that with Ryan over the weekend uh, sorry over the last weekend and I think I think that will do I think that will do wonders for um you know just for the the sort of I suppose the image that we have as fans on the players, as I said, it's it's quite easy often to sort of get carried away with the whole, well, he's a professional footballer in and hundreds of thousands of pounds a week. He doesn't know what it's like to be me. He's, you know, he's completely removed from reality, etc., etc. And the, the reality is, OK, yes, nobody's disagreeing that these people get paid a ridiculous amount of money, but they are just normal, everyday sort of 23, 24-year-old lads who, who seem to do the same things as I do when they're not playing football. So, uh, big, big shout-out to Ryan. I thought it was fantastic for us to be able to see that side of a couple of the players, and I know a lot of Blues have, have sort of watched that live stream and, and, and found it really entertaining and really funny, like myself, and, and talked to sort of players like Nathan Patterson, who we hadn't really heard or known much about. We'd known that he'd been in and out of the team. We'd known that he'd got a little bit of potential. He's got things to work on, but we didn't really know much about his personality. We didn't really know much about what he was about, other than the one or two interviews we may have seen on him on Everton TV, where he's being ultra professional and he sat down and he's being very sort of media trained and, and doing what he, you know, he's supposed to do. Whereas this was was a chance for us to see him in a little bit more of a comfortable. Um, sort of moments, I suppose, along with James Garner and, and Dwight McNeil, and I think that will do good for the fan base to be able to see the players sort of settled and comfortable and, 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 and opening up like that, um, because it just shows that they are just like us, and um, I suppose the overall point of this conversation is, I said a couple of months ago, and I will say it again, these footballers, whilst they may earn a lot of money, whilst they may you know live a life that none of us uh, live and, and would only dream of living, they are normal people, they are human beings with emotions, with feelings, with frustration, with anger, with excitement, with momentum, with confidence, without confidence. And I think when you go out there and you put a performance in like Everton did last Saturday uh, and it wasn't brilliant, it wasn't fantastic, it wasn't massively entertaining, it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't a hugely exciting game of football, it really was a, a game of football uh, between two poor sides in, in poor form who, who look like they couldn't have bought a win if they'd have tried. But we dug deep 
we battled, we worked hard, we fought, you know, we put ourselves about and we come away with the win. And even if it was a, a fluky goal, I got the win and, and there wasn't much else in the game. If you would have said to me, you know, at one o'clock last Saturday going into that game, listen, Cam, Everton are going to win this, but it's going to be a fluky, you know, one in a million goal that you'll probably never see again. Um, and it's not going to be a very good game and it's not going to be a very good performance. I would have still absolutely snatched your hand off for that. I would have snatched your hand off for it because we'd not won a game of football in four months. Um, you know, we were on our longest winless run in some, something like 70 odd years. So it didn't matter how we won. All that matters is that we won. And I think, as I said, the, the feeling in the dressing room after that game, I'm sure, will have been one of relief, joy, um, sort of, you know, a feeling of, right, OK, let's build on this now. Let's build momentum. And then all of a sudden, 48 hours later, they're waking up to the news that they've had another two points taken away from them. And I suppose we'll start there, really, in, in terms of the main... Um, <coughs> subject points and, and topic points to discuss um yeah we got the news on on monday wasn't it that everton had been deducted a further two points uh, for breaching premier league profit and sustainability rules again which obviously takes our overall total this season of eight points deducted um we had an initial 10 point deduction which we played with for two months three months whatever it was that obviously was then appealed down to six and then you add this one on top, makes it eight. And again, I know we've done the video on um, Tuesday, didn't I, where I sat down and, and I spoke about this in a little bit more detail. And I'm not just going to sit here and, and repeat what I said on Tuesday because um, I know a lot of you will have seen that video. And big, big thank you to everybody that did see that video and, and did support it. Um, but again, my feeling hasn't really changed on this subject. I actually was more angry reading the headline yesterday that we spoke about on yesterday's video, the fact that Sky Sports were trying to make out that it was actually Luton that were the victims of this situation. That wound me up more than reading the headline that Everton had been deducted another two points. And the reason being is, like I said on Tuesday, I just expect it now. I just expect it. It just feels at the moment, and I know people will say, oh, woe is me, get over yourself, blah de blah de blah I don't care. It just feels at the moment like we can't have anything good. We can't have any bit of positivity. We can't have any bit of momentum. We can't have any bit of confidence. We can't have <coughs> any bit of, um, <coughs> you know, structure. We can't have that momentum. We can't, you know, go and get a good win and then go into the next game confident and pick up another, you know, good win and, 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 and maybe go on a little bit of a run. It just feels like we can't have that at the moment. And not only because the performances on the pitch aren't good enough and the performances from the manager haven't been good enough, but it feels like even when we do get a big win, we get news that we've had more points taken away from us. And it just... It, it, I'd describe it as... I would describe it as <clears throat> sort of... I, I, I don't know, being a boxer and walking away from a, a bout that you've won and you've had your, ha your, your hand held high and you've not won a fight for a few a few years and, you you know, you win this one, your hand gets held high, it's absolutely brilliant, uh, you know, you, you're buzzing and then you're walking down to go towards your dressing room and somebody comes up behind you and gives you a low blow to the bollocks. It sort of feels like that, doesn't it? It sort of feels like, you know, again, we were in, we'd had the win. wasn't a great performance. We'll talk about it in a bit. wasn't a great performance. wasn't an unbelievable game of football, but it didn't matter. At this point in the season, results are paramount. And that was a huge, huge result for Everton. And literally within 48 hours, it felt like all of that joy and all of that sort of, Ex not excitement, because I don't think anyone was massively excited, but certainly that sort of weighted pressure of, right, okay, we've gone and got that win now. Let's build on that. Let's take some confidence from it. Let's build some momentum from it. It just feels like that was all ripped from us within 48 hours of us winning. And even though the last time Everton walked off a pitch, we were walking off with three points, going into this game on Monday against Chelsea, it doesn't feel that way for me. It just doesn't. Because of this point deduction news, it doesn't feel like we're coming into this one off the back of a win. We are, and we ultimately have to think like that, and the players have to think like that going into it, and the manager has got to drill that into the players because that is really, really important because at the end of the day, 
you know, even though we've had the point deduction news and even though that might be a little bit of a kick in the balls, we've still coming into this game off the back of a win and a huge, huge win at that. But <clears throat> it it just doesn't feel that way, does it? It, it just doesn't feel like that. It, it feels like, you know, again, Saturday's game against Burnley, huge win, first win in four months, you know, ending our longest winless run for 50-odd years, 70-odd years, whatever it is. Somebody will correct me in the comments. Um, and it doesn't feel like there's any form of positivity or there was any form or there's any form of sort of momentum because of, of the news we had on Monday. And yeah, <clears throat> I've said it before and I'll say it again. It, it, it's a disgrace. It's an absolute disgrace. Um, You know, Everton have had eight points taken away from us this season and two separate point deductions. The Premier League asked for 17 points to be taken away from Everton this season. 17 points. Now, by the way, again... I'm not hugely <clears throat> uh, clued up on the process of <clears throat> point deductions and the process of, you know, PNS charges and then appeal committees and independent committees and all of this nonsense that we've heard over the last sort of eight months or so of the season. And this has been, by the way, this is inarguable. This has been the worst season ever for English football, in my opinion, certainly for the Premier League, but for English football, in my opinion, this has been the worst season ever. How can you have a season where multiple teams are going out there, putting performances in, earning points, and then getting those points taken away from them? Points that were earned by the team, were earned by the manager, benefited the fans, benefited the players, taken away from us. And again, for me... It doesn't make any sense because I don't see a world in which the Premier League or the independent committees or whoever it is genuinely in their mind think that point deductions affect Farhad Mashiri because they don't. And I'm not suggesting Everton should have got a fine for breaching FFP because I understand people are saying, oh, well, you know, what's the point in giving fines out when the whole reason you're being charged is because you've spent too much money? I get it. I understand it. But I don't understand how giving point deductions out is meant to punish the people that are responsible for us being in this position. Because it's not Sean Dyche's fault Everton are in this position financially. It's not the players' fault Everton are in this position financially. It isn't. And people go, oh, but the wages and the contracts, that's not the players' fault. You know, if I'm sitting here and I'm doing this podcast and I get a phone call from Chelsea or Derby or Tottenham saying, listen, we want to pay you 700 million quid a week to come and play for us for six months. I'm obviously going to take it, aren't I? It's not the player's fault for taking the contract that was put in front of them. It's the club's fault for putting that contract in front of them in the first place. But I can tell you now 100% for certain, the fans aren't at fault. The fans aren't responsible for this. The fans have done absolutely nothing wrong. The fans haven't got any control over Everton's finances. The manager hasn't got any control over Everton's finances. It's not his fault. The player's... It's not their fault. They've been offered huge contracts and they've taken them. And yet, they, we, are the only three groups of people that are being punished. The players, the manager and the fans. The owner's not being punished, is he? Farad Mishiri doesn't care if we go down or if we stay up or whatever. I know some people say, well, he won't get as much money if we go down. The takeover will likely be completed before the end of May anyway. <clears throat> so... Regardless of whether Everton stay up or go down, it doesn't really mean much to Farhad Mashiri. The people that are responsible for the position Everton are in are the owner, who, as I said, isn't being punished. The chairman, of course, again, you know, we know what's happened there, but it has to be said he's responsible for this. And the previous board, who got a fat payout and are now probably sitting on a beach somewhere in, in, in the Bahamas, you know, with their feet up, laughing their head off. They're the people that were responsible for Everton being in this position, in this situation. And they are the people, the board, the owner, that haven't been punished. And that are being allowed to walk away from this situation relatively comfortable. And will probably walk into another job in, in a similar position at some point in the future. Despite the fact that it's their responsibility for us being in this position. The people that are being punished are the fans, the players and the manager. And <clears throat> as I've said... I completely disagree with it, and I think it makes an absolute, it, it makes a, a, a mockery of the Premier League. 
it really, really does. And I know Anzos Townsend come out and said that, and we spoke about that in um, in yesterday's video, but it really, really does make a mockery of the Premier League. It makes it laughable, and it and and it makes it makes me laugh when you've got pundits from places like Sky and BT and you know various other um sort of companies trying to come out every week and ram down our throats about how the Premier League's the best league in the world. Oh my god, it's the best league in the world. Look at how great the Premier League is. I'm sick of hearing it. Whether it be from Carragher, whether it be from Neville, whether it be from Peter Crouch, whoever it might be from, I'm sick of hearing this bollocks, this agenda-driven, narrative-driven nonsense that the Premier League's the best league in the world. Of course, you think that the Premier League's the best league in the world because you are paid a lot of money by your employees to put that message across because your employees pay a lot of money to have the rights to the Premier League. So you're not going to come out and say, this is a fucking shambles, it's a mockery, because you're getting paid effectively by the company that are paying billions of pounds a year for this product. It's not the best league in the world whatsoever. In fact, it's one of the worst leagues in the world. Yes, it might have some of the best players. Yes, it might have the best team in the world. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. But we currently play in a league which is designed for six teams to fight at the top and the other 14 to effectively just be there to take part. And the Premier League and Richard Masters can come out with any drivel and any bollocks and any nonsense that they want. Oh, we welcome anyone in the Premier League. The Premier League's for everyone. Everyone's an equal shareholder. That's fine. And I get it. And that's another thing I keep being told. What do you mean the Premier League? Cam, there's 20 teams in the Premier League. They're each equal shareholders. Yes, they are. Of course they are. And if, if you for one second don't think that football clubs... Um, football clubs see themselves as being in competition with other football clubs, then you're soft, because of course they do. Every Premier League football club is in competition with each other. Of course they are. But if you also don't think that the heads up of the Premier League, the people like Richard Masters, the people that surround Richard Masters, aren't in it for the coin and aren't in it for making as much money as possible, you're also pretty thick. Because these companies, these multi-billion pound companies, only care about one thing, and that is the money in their pocket. And that has been proven time and time again. By the way, no matter how many times these pundits who are paid to say what you know what they're told, no matter how many times you know these financial experts, otherwise known as knobheads, uh, who have frequented talk sport, come out on Twitter and, and, and back the Premier League and say how it's fair and it's this and it's that and the other. It is not. We all know it's not. Of course we know it's not. We're talking about a league that are now telling teams like Aston Villa and Newcastle they've got to They've got to sell some of their best players in order to build. Are you going to tell New? Are you going to tell Liverpool they need to sell some of their best players in order to build this summer? Are you going to tell Manchester United they need to sell some of their players? Are you going to tell Arsenal? Well, if you want to go and sign a new striker to challenge for the league next season, you need to sell Declan Rice. No, you fucking not. All right, Arsenal, Liverpool, City, they might be at the top of the game. They might be the, the best teams in the world. Fine. Are you going to tell Chelsea they can't go and spend another £500 million despite the fact that they're bang average mid-table side? No, you're not. You're going to allow it to happen. But you're going to tell Aston Villa, who have been managed brilliantly, been ran brilliantly, spent their money brilliantly, got a fantastic manager in, doing really well. You're going to tell them that if they want to take a step up, they've got to sell one of their better players in the summer. It's bollocks. It's it's utter bollocks and, and as I said, I've I've had I've had the argument time and time again with people that just seem to be absolutely certain that the Premier League is this squeaky clean product that is absolutely fair for everybody and everybody can compete and everybody uh you know is welcome to challenge for the for the league and all of this. It's nonsense. It's absolutely nonsense. And as I said the other day, I can't remember whether it was in the last episode of the podcast or whether it was in I think it might have been in the point deduction video we did. Um like I said the other day, I would I would pay a lot of money to see every single Premier League official who was around in 2016 when Leicester won the league title. I would pay a lot of money to see them all sit down um, and do a lie detector test about whether or not they were actually pleased when Leicester won the title. Because I bet you they weren't. I bet you they were absolutely furious when Leicester won that championship. Because they knew that wasn't what's best for business. That's not what's best for, for, for money. Richard Scudamore, Richard Scudamore, who is an, an ex-Premier League CEO, I'm going to get this up now so I can read it um, word for word, has admitted that the Premier League needed Manchester United 
to be successful in order for their brand. This is on TNT Sport. Richard Scudamore, who is who is now was Premier League chief executive, is obviously now an ex Premier League chief executive. He is admitted in 2015. Now you might think, well, why are you going back that far? Camp? I'm just proving that these things exist within football. These things that. As I said, certain financial knobheads that think that they know a lot can come out on Twitter and defend. These things exist. <coughs> Richard Scudamore, this was probably at the time that um, Scudamore was in charge. I think he would have been in charge at this time of the Premier League. He come out and he said, the Premier League brand has been damaged by Man United struggles this season, says Richard Scudamore. League Chief Executive Scudamore suggests the global popularity of the Premier League will slump if David Moyes' side continue to toil. Last season's English champions are 7th in the league table, 18 points behind leaders Chelsea. Scudamore was speaking in South Africa on a promotional tour to promote the world's richest league. That's what it is, not the world's best league, it's the world's richest league. And he said, when your most popular club isn't doing as well, that costs you incest and audience in some places just think about that for a second think about that and think about something else i'm going to tell you as well think about the fact that mike dean come out less than a year ago and admitted that he purposely didn't send anthony taylor to the monitor to check what was a blatant red card offense because he felt sorry for him and he was having a difficult day and he was his friend they're not just a colleague, you know, they're friends and Anthony was having a difficult day so I didn't send them over. Mike Dean wasn't sacked for that, despite the fact it was effectively match-fixing, despite the fact he ignored what was a sending off which could have changed the outcome of an important game of football because he wanted to protect his friend. He wasn't sacked for that. He wasn't told off, he wasn't put in any trouble, he wasn't given any form of punishment for that. He was made the head of refereeing on Sky Sports or whatever it is. He's the one that they go to to, to ask for decisions. Not David Gallagher. Um, but, you know, Mike Dean is often... I think he does the Soccer Saturday panel. I think he sits in on the Soccer Saturday, Soccer Saturday panel and they go to him every time there's a, a, a referee decision. That is after he come out and admitted, oh, yeah, I didn't give a certain decision purely because I wanted to protect my friend. You've then you know, sort of nine years ago, got a Premier League executive coming out and saying, well, when Man United don't do well, we don't do well as a brand. Come on, people. We're not stupid. I know some people say, oh, conspiracy theorists, you've got your tin for your lath on, etc., etc. Look at this, look at that, look at the other. Look at the facts that are out there. That's come from the horse's mouth himself. That isn't just a fella on the street. That isn't just a random news reporter. He was the chief executive of the Premier League, he was what Richard Masters is now, and he come out and admitted that when Man United don't do well, we don't do well. Now, yet yeah, effectively, that isn't him saying we're gonna try our hardest to, to to make Manchester United do well. I get that, but I I think we'd be quite silly to think that these people aren't money orientated and aren't money driven. They clearly are money driven. They clearly are all about the pocket. I mean, listen, Everton are playing Chelsea away from home on a Monday night. Eight o'clock kickoff on a Monday night away from home. Everton are playing Chelsea. Why? What's the reason? What's the reason for, you know, thousands of Evertonians to have to travel all the way down the country on a Monday evening, most of whom will have been in work on that Monday and will be in work on the Tuesday when this could game could have been played tomorrow? This game could have been played on Sunday. What's the need for the Monday night game? Because it makes them more money. It puts more money in their pocket. We know all of these people are just about money. Of course they are, because you don't become a billionaire, a millionaire, you know, a, 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 a head of a, of a billion pound brand or multi-billion pound brand unless you are driven by profit and driven by income and we know that they are and 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 again listen again i know i'll get the same comments everton have broken the rules everton have breached everton deserve to be given a point deduction etc 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 whatever i keep hearing the same thing week in week out it, it, it's unbelievable isn't it how these rules have now become sort of like 
like like absolutely everybody's got to abide by. It's funny, isn't it? It's funny how now, whenever you try and defend, you know, Everton's situation, and I'm not even defending Everton in this because, as I'm sure a lot of you will know, I've spoken openly over the last couple of years about how disgracefully Everton have been run and, and how the people in charge of Everton had needed removing for a long, long time. It's not even a case of defending Everton Football Club. But I just find it really, really interesting how now these rules that everybody ignored for a decade and nobody really worried about Fulham, didn't worry about when they come up and spent over a hundred million and went down. QPR didn't worry about I think it might have just been before QPR actually, but QPR certainly didn't worry about any financial rules when they were spending hundreds of millions to get relegated. You know, Villa had done it before before this spell. Villa, you know, a number of years ago had had the spell where they'd come up, <clears throat> spent a fair bit of money and, and struggled. Lots of teams have done it. But now, now that the Premier League are in threat of an independent regulator and they've decided to make an example out of one of the, the, the country's most historical clubs, now, all of a sudden, those rules are absolute, you know, written in stone, got to abide by them. Football fans now coming out going, well, you broke the rules, so I've got to abide by them. What, you mean them rules that nobody cared about for 10 years? Them rules that weren't enforced for 10 years? That rule that nobody batted an eyelid for 10 years? And are only now batting an eyelid because of the fact that there's a threat of an independent regulator? You mean them rules that are getting changed in the summer because they've been deemed not fit for purpose? Them same rules are we talking about? Yeah, yeah, we are. We absolutely are. And let's not forget... For anybody saying that the Premier League isn't biased, the Premier League hasn't got an agenda, the Premier League's fair, it wants everybody to compete. The Premier League had admitted themselves that they don't make the decision on the point deduction. They give the case to an independent commission and an independent commission determines what punishment is given to Everton or Forest or anybody else that breaks financial rules except Chelsea and Manchester City and probably Liverpool, Man United, Tottenham, Arsenal or, you know, any other, any team that makes a lot of money, doesn't matter, any other team, you know, you're getting a point deduction. The Premier League had said themselves, one of the Premier League's defences, and I think one of Richard Masters' defences against the, um, the obviously, the, the, what can we say, protests against them from Evertonians. One of his defences, when he sat in front of, you know, those members of parliament, um, he said, well, we don't give the point deductions out. We don't give them out. It's an independent commission. We pass it to an independent commission and an independent commission give the point deductions out. Right. Sound. Absolutely sound. So why did you run to that independent commission and ask for 17 points to be taken away from Everton this season? If you don't make the decision... And one of your your defensive points is going to be, well, we don't make the decision. We just give it to an independent commission. Then why are you suggesting any number? Why don't you just say, listen, we've found Everton in breach. It's nothing to do with us what punishment they get. We're going to give it to them and they're going to decide what punishment they get. Why did you run the first time and say, we want them to get 12 points? We think they should get 12 points which was then narrowed down to 10 which was then actually said in the official document that uh, they don't. The the independent commission didn't understand how they got to ten in the first place. It, it didn't make any sense. It was hugely excessive. But the Premier League wanted twelve. Fast forward to the second case. You'd think they'd learn the lesson. All right, we won't say nothing this time. We'll just we'll just put it you know put it to one side, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Give it to them and let them deal with it. No, they asked for five this time as well, which again was legally knocked down to two. So the Premier League this season, without any real process in place, because there is no real process in place, there's not, you know, a, a chart that they look at and they go, okay, well, Everton have done that, so that means this punishment, Everton have done that, so that means this punishment. There isn't any. It's, they're making it up as they go along. They are purely making it up as they go along. And they asked for 17 points to be taken away from Everton. So if there's no process, if there's no... <clears throat> rules written down physical rule book written down to say if you breach by this amount you get this amount of points if you breach by this amount you get this amount of points if that doesn't exist which it doesn't and you are asking for 17 points to be taken away from a football club who have earned them in the premier league that to me confirms that there's an agenda against 
our football club. Now, some people will say, why? Why would they be an agenda against Everton? And that's, that's another thing I keep hearing, and we are going to move on in a minute because we need to move on. Um, I don't know, maybe because we're one of the most vocal clubs to come out against the Super League, who, you know, who, who threatened to destroy the entirety of the football pyramid for everybody in the Premier League, begged them to come back and effectively, um, you know, effectively said, we'll do whatever you want for us to come, for you to come back. Maybe that, maybe because we were one of the, 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 the big, you know, the, the, the sort of main clubs to stand up and say it's a disgrace and they need punishing and the Premier League didn't like that. We were coming for their, you know, their favourites. Um... Maybe that. Maybe it's because when the first point deduction was given out, you know, we didn't just sit down and take it on the chin as fans. We didn't just accept it and move on. We protested against it. We created banners. We lit up historical buildings within the city of Liverpool. We we put a, a, a van outside the Premier League's um, headquarters with a number of slideshows on and, and, and depicting that it was a disgrace and that Richard Masters is a disgrace. Maybe because of that. Because I know full well if somebody did what we did as a fan base, and I'm not having a go at us, by the way, because it was absolutely right that the punishments are a disgrace and, and there is a clear agenda against everybody and, and uh, against Everton, sorry, and you don't come for Everton Football Club in, in, in that way because we will react as a fan base. We won't just sit back and, and let it go. But if you think about it logically, I'm not saying I, I'm, I'm, I'm against it, but if you think about it logically, if somebody done that to you or me because they didn't agree with the decision and, you know, they had buildings projected with pictures of your face on and you know big vans parked outside your office and various posters being hung up and booze and chants and this that and you're there you'd probably be a bit fuming wouldn't you you'd probably be a little bit oh well fuck them then it makes sense for richard masters to not like everton football club because we don't like or for not like evertonians because we don't like him and it makes even more sense when you think about the fact he's asked for 17 points to be removed from us this season it's nonsense. It's nonsense. Anyway, let's have a little bit of a chat about the effects of that two-point deduction because I do want to talk about the Burnley game and, of course, that game against Chelsea upcoming uh, a little bit later on. But um, as I said before, <clears throat> it, it, it's very, very difficult to expect these players to not be affected by this. I heard uh, I was driving home from... Uh, I was driving to work, sorry, this morning and I heard something on the radio... Um, and it, it was it was it was a uh, somebody reporting on one of the news reporters reporting on something Sean Dyche had said, and I think it, I think they said something along the lines of Sean Dyche has said that the latest point deduction will actually bring the Everton squad together and will bring them closer together. Um, you know, and than than they've been before, and and I remember hearing it and thinking, okay, well, if that. <clears throat> if that is the case, then great, absolutely great. If if that's the case, then brilliant. If Everton now start putting in some performances and the players start putting in some some um you know performances where we can sit back and go, well, do you know what? That was a good win today, or that we we played well, we battled there, we worked hard. If the manager now has gone right, okay, well, I I can't just keep things the way that they are, and I need to change things because you know we've had another point deduction here, we've lost more points, so I need to make sure we're going out and winning games then great, absolutely great, I'm all for it, do I strictly agree with it, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, we'll wait and see how they perform on Monday, I'm sure we'll know on Monday night, judging by the performance and judging by the way in which we portray ourselves on that pitch, whether or not this has had a negative or, I don't want to say, it, it, will, it wouldn't have had a positive impact, but a neutral impact on us, shall we say, Um, but, as I said earlier on in the in the podcast, these players are human beings. You know, regardless of the the amount of money they earn, regardless of the job they do, regardless of the the fame they have and the status they have, they're still human beings, and they are human beings who will have been affected by that. Of course, they will because they've gone out, they've trained, they've worked hard, they've put in the graft, they've won their first game in four months, big, huge, huge win for the football club. And then all of a sudden, they've had two of those points ripped away from them. If Everton had walked away from Goodison Park last Saturday with just a point, I think the majority of us fans would have been quite frustrated with that, quite upset, quite angry with that, the fact that we'd only walked away with a point. We didn't. We walked away with three points, and everybody was as happy as could be, really. Performance wasn't great, of course, but I think we all know at this point in the state, in, in the season, it's it's definitely results over performance. Um, But it now feels like that feeling of joy and, 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 and sort of 
again, I don't think it was particular excitement or joy, more so a case of um, the pressure being lifted a little bit, the weight being taken off of our shoulders a little bit. That now effectively is a void because we've got two of those three points that we earned on Saturday have now been removed from us. What the manager now needs to do is he needs to ensure that feeling <clears throat> of relief and you know a little bit of confidence, a little bit of joy that those players would have had post Saturday's game he needs to ensure that that stays now within the team and that the point deduction isn't a, a kick in the bollocks as I described it earlier on in the podcast. We need to make sure the point deduction isn't something that, you know, is now going to get, you know, knock us down again after a, a big, big win in, in, in um, you know, in a big, big moment in the season because we have got a lot of very, very winnable games coming up. We've got to play Sheffield United at Goodison Park. We've got to play Brentford uh, at Goodison Park. We've got to play Nottingham Forest at Goodison Park as well. We've got a lot of very winnable games coming up and we can't afford uh, for this to have a, a huge effect on us. And, 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 and again, that is a, is a big task for the manager because naturally it would have a huge effect on the players, of course it would, because it's the second time they've had points taken away from them this season uh, wrongfully after they'd earned them. So, naturally, it would have an effect on the players. Naturally, the players probably are feeling a little bit down, a little bit shit about it. But we need to make sure that <clears throat> we focus on Saturday's result and on the momentum and confidence we can take from Saturday's result and not on Monday's result, uh, which was a, a, you know, a, a disappointing time for all of us. Um, and by Monday's result, I'm talking about the point deduction, not Chelsea. Um... We will talk about Chelsea, though, a little bit later on in the podcast. Before we do that, let's talk a little bit about the Burnley game um, because we haven't spoken about it much since, obviously, we did our instant match reaction on Sunday, uh, but we haven't spoken about it in any greater depth. Um, different one for me. A little bit of a mad one for me. I watched it in a, uh, in a, in a corporate seat which was nice. No, I wasn't offered it by the club. No, I haven't taken corporate seats but from 777 or from, you know, Everton or Far Up the Shady. No, fortunately, um, fortunately, a, a, a very, very nice couple got in touch with, with, with Matty. Matty got in touch with me, asked me if I fancied it and I said, yeah, and that was it really. And, and I had a lovely day, absolutely lovely day, brilliant company, um, you know, got on really, really well with, with, with the couple that we met up with. Food was nice, um, you know, what, what I expected really. And the view of the pitch was incredibly different. So I watched the game from a sort of side-on view rather than a straight-on view. Usually, <clears throat> I'm in the park end behind the goal, so my view is is looking straight down the pitch, whereas now I was looking at it sort of from the side and I could see both ends. Um, there's a word there to describe it, horizontal or vertical, but I always get confused with them. So, basically, I was watching from the main stand. I usually watch from the park end. I should have just said that in the first place. That would have been much easier. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I didn't think it was a very good performance whatsoever. I'll be honest, I think the first 45 minutes, well, up until the 45th minute when we scored, I thought was poor. I thought we were lacklustre. I thought we were void of any real idea. I thought we were void of any real quality. Um, <clears throat> we had a couple of sort of half moments, I suppose, where we got forward and we looked like we could put them under a little bit of pressure. But every time we did it, the final ball just wasn't good enough. Ashley Young had a couple of opportunities to put crosses in and this is... His final ball was was poor. Um, I think Dwight McNeil had one or two chances to put the ball in the box as well and just couldn't reach his man. So again, it, it felt like another it felt like another game where we just didn't have any idea or just didn't have any real plan or any real setup to go out and win it. And thankfully for us, Burnley were very similar. Burnley were very, very similar. And this is no disrespect to Burnley. Um, but, you know, Everton have beaten them three times this season and, and we went four months without a win. In fact, the last time we won a game prior to Saturday was Burnley away at Turf Moor in the league, um, ironically. But, yeah, like I said, it, I think it was both teams were really, really poor. Burnley had a spell of 10 or 15 minutes in that first half just before the, the half ended where 
had they have had a little bit more quality, had they have had a little bit more bravery, maybe they'd have created a, a, a better chance. I mean, Jordan didn't really have anything to do all day. You know, he effectively was just stood in the sticks, um, not really doing much. But they did have periods in the game where they had control of the ball and they had control of the possession. And, um, you know, had they have had maybe a little bit more confidence or maybe a little bit more quality, <coughs> pardon me, they may have, have, have made something more out of that than, than they actually did. Um, Obviously, the goal comes just before half time, a, a perfect time for us to score because it had been a really, really poor first forty-five minutes, and 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 I felt a little bit concerned that the reaction at half time may not necessarily have been one that we would have wanted because fans would have been frustrated, fans would have been annoyed. It was still nil nil, so it wasn't like we were losing. It wasn't like we were out the game, but um, it was much of the same. It was much of the same for me. It was much of the same that we'd watched, um, you know, over the last couple of weeks ago. Newcastle, obviously, we managed to get a point, but the performance wasn't particularly great. Certainly not in the first half. Second half, we were much better against Newcastle, but the first half, we were absolutely dire. And I think this was very similar. I think second half, we were much better on Saturday, but the first half, we were dire. And thankfully, uh, <coughs> we do get that goal right at the end of uh, of the half. And, and look, it's, it's, it's a, an incredible bit of luck by Dominic Calvert-Lewin, it's absolutely terrible, terrible goalkeeping, uh, I'm not quite sure what the, the goalkeeper's doing, but you know, it is, we'd be we'd be lying if we were to sit here and say that it wasn't lucky, it wasn't fortunate, of, of course it was, it was massively, massively fortunate, but it's about time Everton got a bit of luck, it's about time Everton had a bit of fortune, because I'm sick to the back teeth, of us always being unlucky. And I'm not talking about point deductions or talking about league positions. We are where we are because of the gross mismanagement of this football club over the number of years. However, we are also the unluckiest football club in the world as well. You know, and I'm not blaming anything that's gone on with the financial stuff or with the board as, as being bad luck. But it, it just seems like when there's a moment on the pitch where it could go our way or it could go the opposition way, it always goes the opposition way. Uh, <clears throat> whereas it didn't. It didn't on Saturday. We got that little bit of luck. Uh, we got that little bit of fortune. Goalkeeper wastes too much time trying to clear the ball. Dom lashes his foot up and thankfully it, it loops over him. And as I said, from the view I was at, I couldn't really see whether or not it was going on target. My my typical season ticket view, I'd have been able to see straight away. But I remember it looping over the goalkeeper. And I sort of went like that on my seat. And I looked around and nobody was really seeming to rea react. And I thought, that to me looks like it's looping in. But maybe it's not. Maybe it's actually looping over the bar or it's looping wide. And that's why nobody else is. It felt like it caught everyone by surprise that everyone sort of just went from being... Oh, more the same to sort of oh, 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 it's gone in. That's exactly what the reaction was like in the in the stadium. Certainly, from where I was, it wasn't a case of oh my god, you know, throw everything in the air. Obviously, everybody got up and was celebrating, but it was almost like a oh, I've scored. It was it was a shock. Um, um, look. It was a fluky goal. <clears throat> it was a fortunate goal. It was probably a goal Dominic Calvert-Lewin will never score again in his uh, life. But what it was was a really, really important goal. A really, really important goal and a crucial goal. And if you had said to me before the game come, Everton are going to win the game by a little bit of a fluky goal, I'd have absolutely snatched your hand off for it. I'd have absolutely snatched your hand off for it because I wouldn't have cared if the ball had gone in off somebody's arse on Saturday. I wouldn't have cared if it had gone on off the back of somebody's ear as long as the ball goes in the back of the net and Everton win that game of football. That's all that matters, regardless of how it happens, regardless of how the, the ball actually does go in the net. That's all that matters is is winning that game. And, and that's exactly what we did. Um... Like I said, I think it came at the right time, and I think it it it, it was a, a really really important goal for Dom as well. You know, again, two and two now for Dominic Calvert Lewin, and I know some people will say, "Calm down, calm." It's only a penalty and a fluky deflection. I get, I get that, but sometimes when you're a striker who's on a twenty odd game run without a goal, sometimes what you need to get yourself back into form and back into the swing of things is you know a little bit of luck and and a penalty. You know, and and, and I think. I think they were the <coughs> only two ways Dom was going to get himself back into form because he didn't look, he never looked confident one on one with the goalkeeper. He, he wasn't looking confident up in the air. He wasn't looking confident when balls were dropping to him on the edge of the box. So it felt like the only way he was going to break that um, poor run of form for himself personally was 
via a little bit of luck or was via the ball bouncing to him in the six yard box, you know, fortunately or a penalty. And as I said, I don't care whether Dominic Calvert Lewin scored two overhead kicks in the last two games or whether he scored two penalties, as long as he's put that ball in the back of the net twice and he has. And that I think is really, really important. And that I think will do <coughs> Dom the absolute world of good as well. I think that will do Dom the world of good moving forward. Uh, as I said, we come out in the second half and I thought we were much better. I thought we were much, much better in that second half than we were in the first half. I don't think we were great still. I'm not saying we were unbelievable. We were playing brilliant football. We were knocking it about. We were exciting to watch. We weren't. We just seemed to run around a little bit more. We just seemed to give a little bit more. I thought Dwight McNeil had his best game in um, in a number of weeks. And yes, people will say, why Cam? Just because he ran around. Well, well, yeah, he did run around. He did have, you know put himself about a little bit. But you know what? He didn't do that last week. He didn't do that the week before. He didn't do that the week before that. So that's an improvement. Whether or not that should be a standard and that should be something we expect every week, I agree. But that was an improvement on what we'd seen recently. Um, and I think he deserves praising for that. As I said, I thought Dom put himself about well. Um, you know, I thought Beto put himself about well when he come on. Obviously, they had the sending off, which was a huge, huge moment in the game. I've still not actually watched it again. From the ground, in the stadium, it, it looked like it was a sending off. Um, but then... I sort of looked again and it looked a little bit like maybe there was a couple of other players around him so he wasn't last man and then I went home and I spoke to my dad about it and my dad said uh, no it was it was definitely a sending off he was you know even though Dwight McNeil mightn't have had an awful lot of pace he was still through with a, a huge opportunity to score so I, I, again like I said before about the goal you know how many times have we saw players throw challenges in against Everton, and, and they should have been sent off. I mean, the worst one that still stands for me is Jordan Ayew's in that Palace game when we come back and we won three two to stay in the Premier League a couple of years ago. How Jordan Ayew wasn't sent off for this challenge on the halfway line on Anthony Gordon, I think it was. It, it it's still to this day. I still see that video pop up because, you know, the the Palace game highlights are always popping up and we're always being reminded of it. Um, and I still see that moment pop up frequently on social media and it, it still to this day baffles me how a Premier League referee and a Premier League VAR official looked at that and didn't deem that a sending off. It's one of the most blatant sending offs I've ever seen in my life and it wasn't given. So it's about, you know, even if... It wasn't a sending off or it was debatable or people can argue it. I'm not asked. I honestly don't care because it's about time we got that little bit of luck. It's about time we got a decision that went for us that maybe is a little bit controversial because we don't get enough of them. We always get it the other way around. We always get decisions that go against us that are a little bit controversial or, in fact, massively controversial, like Dom sending off against Crystal Palace. Um, but, yeah, that, that probably did change the game. Um, I actually think... Burnley were the better team when they went down to 10 men. I think we played, and I think we've done this a couple of times of late when, when players have been sent off. I think we played like we had 10 men when actually we were the team with 11 men. Um, And I think that was the moment where I really wanted Sean Dice to go for it. I wanted Sean Dice to go for the throat. I wanted Sean Dice to put a, you know, a couple of attackers on, Beto, Chimiti, and really go for it when they went down to 10 men. We did put... Better one, and, and, and he, had, he had a little bit of a run around, caused a couple of problems, should have earned a, a free kick, at, at the very least on the edge of the box, if not a penalty, it wasn't given by Michael Oliver again. Um, and yeah, I, I thought we were more active in the second half. I thought we were a little bit less shy. I thought we were a bit more confident. I thought players were taking a bit more responsibility. I thought players were taking the game, you know, taking control of the game themselves a little bit more in the second half. Probably because they were confident, because they were 1-0 up. The crowd were happy because we were 1-0 up and, and things were going our way a little bit. They were down to 10 men. So I think we took a little bit more control in that second half. We weren't great. We weren't amazing. We, 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 we didn't absolutely, you know, battered them and, 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 and could have won five or six. We weren't. We weren't. We, you know, we, we were still very, very mediocre. But we were never in trouble, were we? We were never in trouble. It wasn't one part of that game I sat back and thought, oh, my God, Burnley are going to equalise here. Burnley are going to equalise it. There wasn't. Um, we should have had a penalty again <clears throat> at the end of the game. Um, I, I don't know how these referees get away with it week in, week out and don't get punished. And effectively just get told, yeah, bad decision that you'll be referee in Manchester City versus Man United next week. Pack your bags and and see you there. It's it's nonsense. James Garner 
gets fouled in the box. That's twice in the last two weeks we've seen Everton players, Dominic Calvert-Lewin and James Garner, kicked in the box. They go down and no penalty is given because it's deemed not enough contact. But if Salah goes down or Garnacho or Palmer or any one of them via the tiniest touch, we're told, well, it's a penalty because there's contact in the box and it doesn't matter how much contact there is. There's enough contact, blah de blah de blah it's, it's absolute nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. But anyway, we won the game. We come away with a win, and, and that is absolutely huge. And even though, you know, we may have had the point deduction on Monday and that may have knocked the wind out of our sails a little bit, we still picked up a huge, huge win that that, that will be and, and, and well, can be and hopefully will be huge uh, in, in building momentum um, towards the, the end of the season. We go to Stamford Bridge on Monday night, as we said before, an absolute disgrace, an absolute disgrace that, that, that the Premier League have set this game up. Um, again, clearly proven that they only care about one thing and that's the money in their po- pocket. Um, but we go to Stamford Bridge. Chelsea currently sitting ninth in the Premier League table. Oh my God, I've got the air cups. Uh, currently sitting ninth in the Premier League table. 30 games played, 12 wins, 8 uh, draws and 10 defeats, 44 points. Uh, so they are significantly higher than Everton in the table, but nowhere near as high as they should be to be able to spend a billion quid. Um, their recent results, they got a two-all draw with Sheffield United last time out. They've actually drawn two-all twice um, against in the last three games against teams in the bottom three. Two also with Sheffield United on the 7th of April the end of March. They had a two also with Burnley, a 10-men Burnley. Obviously they had that big 4-3 win uh, against Manchester United in the middle of that, um, which was I, I watched that live at an absolutely mad mad game of football. Um you know, ninety plus ten and ninety plus eleven to win it is 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 crazy. But that would have given them a huge, huge amount of confidence, and you'd think they'd be able to build on that with with what you would expect. Quite a comfortable game against Sheffield United. They didn't. They only managed to get a point, albeit it was away from home. Um, they've beaten Newcastle prior to that in the league. Two all draw with Brentford. Um, one all draw with Manchester City. They like a lot of draws, Chelsea. They like a lot of draws at the moment. They like picking up uh, points late on in games, but um. Yeah, this will be an incredibly difficult game. It goes without saying Chelsea have spent an, an absolute sickening amount of money uh, over the last couple of years without any repercussion or, or, or any form of um, control whatsoever. Players like Cole Palmer, who I think is absolutely... I think he's outstanding. I'll be honest, I think he's outstanding. I think Cole Palmer is a generational star. We talk about Foden, and don't get me wrong, I think Phil Foden is absolutely world-class, but I think Cole Palmer's in that in that bracket as well. I think if Cole Palmer was playing for City week in, week out now, he'd be absolutely lightning on fire. He'd be lightning on fire for them, and he's lightning on fire in a... In a in a dysfunctional Chelsea side, I won't say a poor Chelsea side, but certainly a dysfunctional Chelsea side. He's uh, he's lightning on fire there as well. He's been absolutely fantastic this season, fantastic uh, against Manchester United last week to keep us cool and as calm and as, you know to keep himself collected in those latter moments of the game. I think is 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 this is a sign of a really really top player. We know they've got the likes of Enzo Fernandez, Mudrick, and Kunku, Jackson, Caicedo. Their midfield is worth a quarter of a billion pound with Enzo Fernandez and Caicedo costing over a hundred and five million quid each or whatever it was, one hundred and fifteen million quid each. Connor Gallagher in there. They've got Thiago Silva, of course, who brings that experience and quality. Raheem Sterling in there as well. We know the quality that this Chelsea team have. As I said, I, I don't think they're a poor team and I and I don't think um <clears throat> I don't think that word should be used to describe Chelsea. I think they're a dysfunctional team. I think Chelsea, honestly, are a team that are capable of beating any side in the Premier League on any given day. I really do, including Manchester City, including Liverpool. I think Chelsea are a team that, on the day, if everybody is fighting, they've got enough quality in there and they've got enough ability in that team to, to beat any team in the Premier League. But they also, on the flip side, if they're not on their day, They've got, they've not got enough um functionality in that side to uh to, to to be able to grind out wins it seems at the moment or grind out results. Uh, and as I said, it, it's mad because on one given day I think Chelsea could beat any team in the Premier League. On another given day, I think Chelsea could lose to any team in the Premier League, which is a baffling thing to say. But as I said, I don't think that's through a lack of quality. I think that's that's because they're a little bit dysfunctional at the moment because they've got however many players they've brought in over the last two years, 17, 18 players, whatever it is, all worth 
50, 60, 70, 80, 100 million quid and they've thrown them into this team and expected it to gel and mould straight away and it hasn't. However, what it is doing is getting better and better and, and, and they will. They will do that. By the way, the longer and longer these players play together, the longer and longer these players know each other, the longer and longer these players get comfortable with each other, the better and better they will become. And if you've got somebody like Cole Palmer, who is um, who is got a lot of quality in there and is clearly a, a generational talent, then he will drag you through most games. However, this isn't a game Everton should be hugely terrified of. I don't think it's not a game Sean Dyche should be hugely terrified of, and I'll tell you why, firstly, because Everton have been much better away from home this season than we've been at home, and we've often gone into games against teams that we've expected to lose quite heavily in and managed to get something out of them, uh, managed to put a performance in, managed to come away, managed to frustrate them, and B, there's a lot of inexperience in this Chelsea team, and there's a lot of... Um, players that are new to the Premier League, new to English football, new to the physicality of English football, new to the 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 the, um, the demand of English football. And I think I think we can use that to our advantage. I think we can wind Chelsea up. I think we can frustrate them. And, and I think the biggest confidence we can take going into this game, although, as I said, they've got a lot of quality there, I think the biggest confidence we can take going into this game is the fact that they've just drawn to Sheffield United and Burnley. And in, in two of their last three Premier League games, they've drawn to two sides that are below Everton in the Premier League table, one of them being Burnley, who, of course, as I said, we, we saw in the flesh on Monday, uh, sorry, on, on Saturday, and, and they weren't very good whatsoever. So... There's motivation there to be had, and I think the motivation, as I said, is the fact that they've dropped points against teams that are in and around our position recently, so shown that they can drop points. They've got that naivety. I think they've got that little bit of immaturity about them, but also, um, you know, I think we have to look to frustrate them. I think we have to look to wind them up. I think we have to look to get under their skin because I, I think you can do that. And whilst I think Pochettino is a very good manager, I think there's been times this season where he's he's looked. Like he doesn't really know what to do with them, um, and hopefully Monday night is another example of that. So there you go. We're gonna leave it there. If you have enjoyed it, please do leave a like. It does mean a huge, huge amount to me. If you're new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe as well. That would mean a massive, massive amount to me. Uh, we will be back with an instant match reaction on Monday night, and then of course another episode of the podcast next week. So look out for that one. Don't forget to go and check out our video yesterday about why Luton are not the victims of Everton's FFP fiasco and why that story is the biggest load of nonsense I've ever read in my life. Um, and yeah, big, big thank you all for watching. Leave a like if you've enjoyed this one. Subscribe if you're new, and we'll see you after.